oh my goodness, you see what I'm dealing with today if you picked up the notes out here. Why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah, why do bad things happen to good people? I know you've said that before, right? You, you've asked that question before, right? Yeah. I think probably every human being on the earth since the time of Adam and Eve has asked the question, man, why do bad things happen to good people? Or uh, another way to put it, why do the righteous suffer? I mean, I've been trying to live for the Lord. I'm trying to give my tithe, read my Bible, be a great person. I go to church. I'm I'm faithful. I I don't talk about people. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a righteous person. I've given my heart to Christ. Why is it that bad things happen to good people and sometimes good things happen to bad people is the opposite of that. And throughout time, really, the only answer that we Christians have had has been Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So our only, our only string to hold on to when bad things are happening to good people is to hold on to Romans 8.28 and with a kind of a simple, if you want to call it blind faith, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do uh, just because he said so. And so that's been our standard by which we have hung to and clung to right. the saints through the ages. The saints now have hold, held on to that. And God has used that verse to really say a tremendous amount to us. But, but it, there's a, in the Old Testament, there's a story. It's a wonderful example of this. As a matter of fact, I told Tanya, I was looking this weekend, and we were talking about it some. And I said, you know, the, the story of Joseph in the Bible, the Joseph, the son of Jacob that had the 12 brothers, 11 brothers, he was 11, and then only one was younger, Benjamin, which was born after he was gone. And these guys became the 12 tribes of Israel. You remember Jacob's boys. Uh, Joseph, the, the, the brother that had the coat of many colors that was thrown into the pit and sold to the Egyptians and all of that, that is such a tremendous story. That, that story is so great on so many ways. That is probably one of the most fantastic forgiveness stories yeah, yeah, yeah. in all of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It is certainly one of the greatest examples of sibling rivalry that you'll ever see anywhere. Uh, certainly uh, uh, family reconstruction and, and God mending homes after terrible things happen and, and deceit and deception and all of those kind of things have been so prevalent because you know for 40 years, roughly, basically, no, about 32, uh, 20, 22 years, because the last 18, they knew he was alive. Uh, but the first uh, 22 years, dad thought his boy was dead because that's what the brothers told him. Well, let, let, me, let me just tell a little bit of the story and kind of come in. We're going to come in right here where I want you to see. Uh, here's Joseph. Joseph, a wonderful young man, a little boy. Uh, starts having dreams, and these dreams he sees things, and and what he sees is he sees uh, he sees some sheaves like some like some like some sheaves of wheat or something standing in a field, and he and and he sees that this group of sheaves bows down to to a single sheave which is him, and and he tells and he and, and in his innocence and naivete, you know he tells his family, guess what I dreamed last night. I dreamed that, that, that all of you guys bowed down to me. Isn't that great? And then he had another dream. And in this dream, he had, it was the, the moon and the sun and the stars. And, it, and all of them bowed down to a, to, to a single star over here, which was him. And the moon was his dad, and the, I mean, the sun was his dad, and the moon was his mom, and the other stars were his brother. And he woke up that day, and he said, you know, I told you I had that dream yesterday, just, man, last night. You can't imagine what I dreamed last night. I dreamed last night that it was the, the sun and the moon and the stars were you guys, and I was over here like a little star by myself, and all of your stars, sun, and moon just bowed down to my star. Isn't that wild? That is out of sight, right? I mean, it's great. And he's so young and he's so childish and he's so naive that he doesn't imagine, he's not thinking they're going to hate him for that. 
They're going to despise him. You're going to, we're going to bow down to you. Yeah, right. Wait for that, buddy. I mean, even Jacob, his dad got mad about it. But the Bible says, but Jacob got mad about it. Like, I'm not, you, we're, I'm bowing down to my son. But then it said, but he considered this in his heart. He kept this thing and considered it. In other words, Jacob, wasn't, Jacob almost said, well, wait, wait a minute. There might be a little more to it than that. But the point is that the brothers hated him. And so they were out in the fields and doing their things. And, and Jacob sends a little Joseph out there into the field. He's just a kid, just a six years old, five-year little kid. They send him out there into the fields to check on his brothers and so forth. And and, and the brothers see him coming, and, and his dad has made him this beautiful coat of many colors because his dad loves J Joseph more than he loves all the rest of them. And the Bible makes that clear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Joseph is the son that was born of his old age. The other ones are, the other one are, are men. And, you know, I mean, they, they, they have their own deals going on, and they've had their own. Th and here comes little Joseph along, and he was born way after any of them. And he's like the little love of their life, the little precious jewel of their life. And dad makes him his little special coat, and he's running out. And, 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 and he has no idea what's about to happen to him. And his brothers get him, say, come here, boy. And they get him, and they take him, and one of them says, let's kill him. And then, the other, and then, and then, and then Reuben, the oldest brother, says, no, 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 let's don't kill him. Let's don't kill him. Let's just take him over here. We'll, we'll throw him down in this pit over here and, and just let him sit there for a couple of days and get scared and be terrorized. And, and, then, and then we'll you know, bring him back to dad or whatever. And see, Reuben, the Bible says, Reuben had in mind to go back and get him after a few hours. Reuben just wanted to get away from killing him and get him over there out of the way, and then he was going to come back and get him in a few hours. Well, Reuben goes back to working, and the other boys are there, and uh, here comes a caravan down the road of Midianites. They're going down to Egypt is where they're headed. And so Judah says, old praise boy says, uh, hey, let's sell him to the Midianites. Let's don't kill him, and let's, 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 we, we want to get rid of him. Let's sell him to the Midianites. And so the Midianites come by, and they sell him. They sell the little fellow to the Midianites. I mean, the Midianites take him down to Egypt, and after uh, a little while in Egypt, uh, as he grows to be a young teenager, he gets hired by a, a citizen of, the, of Egypt named Potiphar, and Potiphar has a wife, and Potiphar's wife gets all attracted to Joseph, and she proposes some things to him about some liaisons and so forth, and he's, no, he, 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 he rejects that, and, and no, and, he, and she says, yes, you will, and he, no, and he turns to leave, and she, like, he had on, like, maybe a vest, kind of like this, a little cloak, and she, and she grabbed it, and while he was trying to run away, she pull, it pulls off of him, and so she carries the little little cloak to her husband, Potiphar, and says, Joseph tried to rape me. And here's his jacket he left behind. I barely escaped with my life. I'm telling you, this is horrible. <laughs> and so they take Joseph and they throw him into prison. While he's in prison, the king puts also his butler and his baker in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They both had a dream while they were in prison. And remember, here's Joseph our young dreamer who could interpret dreams, who had been gifted by God to see things. He's so close to God. He's so, so right and righteous with God that God's given him the ability to see things and to dream dreams and to make interpretations. This is a gift from God. And while he's in the prison, the, uh, the, but, the, the butler says, oh, man, I had a dream last night. And he said, it was weird as it could be. And Joseph said, well, hey, you know, I've interpreted a dream or two. Uh, what did you dream? He said, well, I dreamed that there was this vine growing. And in this vine, there was three limbs on the vine. And the vine had all kinds of blossoms and, had, and, it, and it even had some fruit on it, some grapes and stuff like that. And I had in my hand a cup and, 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 and I got some of the grapes off of the vine and I squeezed them in the cup and made some wine for the king, and I, and I gave it to the king, and the king drank it. It was fine. Joseph said, well, the three limbs are three days. And the fact that you lifted the, the glass and he received it and everything means that in, within three days, the king is going to lift you out of the prison, and you're going to go back and serve him just as before. Well, the baker... 
hearing that good word, says, let me tell him what I dreamed. What I dreamed was there were, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the top basket were all kinds of foods and fruits and nice things I had made, just wonderful fruit. And I had prepared for the, for the king. And, and all of a sudden, a bunch of birds flew down and ate all the stuff out of the top box. And Joseph said, well, the three, the three baskets are three days. And this means that in three days, you also are going to be lifted up. Your head is be held, held high because it's going to be lifted right off of your body. And that's exactly what happened. Well, when the butler leaves in three days, Joseph says to the butler, hey, man, when you get up there to the king, don't forget a brother down here in the cell. Remember me. I mean, take, you know, tell the king about me, all right? Because I don't really like, I don't think I need to be here, and, I, and I've been here for a, a pretty good a couple of years now, and uh, man, I, wanna, I don't want to stay here anymore. And so uh, when the butler gets up there, he doesn't say a word to the king. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, <laughs> everybody say, all of a sudden, a couple of years later. <laughs> That's how all of a sudden happens a lot of times, right? All of a sudden, a couple of years later, uh, the king, Pharaoh, has a dream. And this dream scared him to death. And he brought in all of his astrologers and soothsayers and magicians and there these interpreters and these uh, prognosticators and all of these people that, that would tell you anything. And, and the king said, uh, tell me what it means. And they said, we don't have a clue. So the king is all mad about it, and he's grumbling around, and he's, he's saying, man, I'm telling you, this is a, man, I can't believe these people couldn't interpret this dream for me. It's a scared me and crazy dream. And the butler said, oh, my goodness, man, how foolish am I? Oh, man, I forgot. There's this guy down in, in, the, in the jailhouse that I had a bunch of bad dreams. I had a bad dream, and the baker had a bad dream, and he told us what those dreams meant. And wouldn't you know it, exactly what he said was going to happen is exactly what happened. Man, we need to get that guy to come up here, and I bet you he could tell you what your dreams mean. And the king says, well, go get him. And they went down there in the prison house, and sure enough, there he was, locked up. He wasn't going anywhere. They knew right where to find him, and they pulled him out, and they came up there, and King said, uh, I dreamed, this is what I dreamed. He said, I dreamed that there was, there was a bunch of fat cows on the riverbank, seven of them, fat cows, seven fat cows, and then out of the, out of the river come little poor, skinny, withered up cows, and the little skinny cows ate up the fat cows. But, they, but the skinny cows didn't get any fatter. And then he said, after I dreamed that, he said, I, I dreamed about seven ears of corn. And this corn, and this is, boy, this got real personal for me when he got into the corn part of it. He had seven ears of corn, and the corn was fat and juicy and plump and filled out. Awesome. And then seven little emaciated, withered up, dried up, skinny ears came and, and consume the big fat ears. What does that mean? And Joseph said, well, the seven cows and the seven ears represent seven years. And the fat cows represent the fact that for seven years and the, and the fat ears of corn represent that for seven years, you are going to have an abundant harvest. You are going to have way more than enough. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to produce boo more than you'd normally do. But after seven years, a famine is going to hit the land. And it's going to be the worst famine that this land has ever, ever seen. And the whole world is going to be in famine. Not just Egypt, but everybody in the whole world is going to be in famine. And so what, 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 what you need to do, king, is 
while you got the seven fat years and full years and producing way more than enough, you need to take, some, you need to take a fifth of that and, and, and every year take a fifth of the harvest and lay it by, put it in barns, silos, get it all stored up so that when the famine hits, everybody in Egypt will have enough food to eat. And who knows, man, we might make a million bucks selling all this stuff to the world because nobody in the world is going to have anything. They're going to have to come to you, king, to get anything to eat. And, Joe, and, and the king says, well, all right then, we'll put you in charge of it. And Joseph becomes the second in command of the nation, the mightiest nation of the world at the time, Egypt. Second in command. The only one that had more authority than Joseph was Pharaoh himself. And wouldn't you know it? It happened just as Joseph said, and they had seven wonderful years, and then all of a sudden seven years of famine came, and, and, and his brothers dragged down out of, out of the promised land up there. It's in, it's in famine. Dragged down there. Here, they hear, man, there's grain in Egypt, and they leave their home up here in Israel, and they come right down through there, and they come to Egypt. And when they get to Egypt, everybody says, you got to go see that guy right over there. That's that guy right there. That's the one you need to see. And so they go over there to see him, and whenever he turns around to look at them, he recognizes who they are. Those are his brothers that sold him into slavery, that put him in that horrible condition where he would be accused for a crime that he didn't commit and go to prison for something he didn't do and stay there for 12 years and finally get released out of there. This, they are the ones. Yeah, yeah. And that he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And he's speaking to them through an interpreter. He can speak Hebrew, but he's speaking the Egyptian language through a, through a translator. So they don't know that he, can, he knows what they're saying. And they're talking to each other in Hebrew, thinking this Egyptian don't know what we talk about. But he, he knows the Hebrew, and, and he says to him, get, you know, he, go get your dad. Your dad's still alive? Yeah, go get your dad. Bring him down. Get your younger brother. You got any brothers? Yeah, bring him down. And all oh, they beg and plead and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, they go get dad, bring him down there. Uh, dad and all the brothers bow down, you know. I mean, this, is, this guy has their life in his hand. This guy's, this guy's, this guy's an Egyptian, this guy, man, oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord. Yeah, you know, give us some grain, give us some wheat. Uh, you're a bunch of spies is what you are. I'm going to tell you, we're going to be off with your head. Please, no. Oh, no, don't do it. You know, he's, 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 just, he's, just, he's just pricking them, you know. And then he finally gives them the grain, and then he reveals himself to them. And, man, what a, what a, what a scene that is. I'm Joseph, your brother. God. Now, you can imagine what started going through the hearts of those brothers. From that point right there, from that point right there, it was, oh, God. Oh, God, Joseph's going to kill us, man. Oh, and he, even though he said he wasn't, he said he forgave us and that, that God meant it for good and he got, and and, they, and and we know he and then when, but but we know when Dad dies. I mean, he's probably not doing it because Dad he doesn't want to break Dad's heart, and so he's going he's going to keep us alive while Dad is alive. But when Dad dies, then uh oh, the purge is going to start. Joseph is going to pull out the knife, and we are dead man for sure. And that's where we pick up in Genesis chapter fifty. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which he, we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before dad died, dad commanded us to say to you, Joseph, I beg you to please forgive the trespasses of your brothers. Now, I don't know if Jacob said that or not. But that was a bunch of scared brothers saying, Joseph, look, you know what dad said before he died? Dad said, dad said, 
Say this to Joseph when I die. Please forgive your brothers, Joseph. They've been wicked and evil, but don't kill them. Yeah. Sounds mighty self-serving to me, doesn't it to you? Now, please forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of your father. Oh, now they're bringing religion in now. Now they're, bring, now they're trying to make him feel guilty like God's going to be mad at him if he does something to him. You know, I mean, boy, they throw in every trick. And Joseph wept when he spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, here's the fulfillment of the sheaves and the stars. Behold, we are your servants. We are your servants, Joseph. We are your servants. They're not, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not having any trouble bowing down now, are they? They're not, they're not full of all pride and haughty and, and uh, let's kill him, our little kid punk brother. We'll teach him not to say anything like that. Joseph said to him, do not be afraid for I am in the place of God. But as for you, and this is one of the classic statements of forgiveness. This is forgiveness to the max, man. You cannot find deeper forgiveness than this. About the only thing deeper would be Christ on the cross where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That would be, about, that would be deeper. But other than that, you're not going to find a deeper forgiveness than this. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. In other words, you, you, meant, you, you tried to kill me. You tried to get rid of me. You didn't, you didn't want me to make it. You hated me, but God took that and God used it for the good of myself and everybody else on this earth, including your raggedy hides and all of your family to keep you alive because if I wasn't here, you would be dead. No food, no life. So God used it to bless all of us. And the New Testament counterpart to this verse of forgiveness and thought is, and we know that all things, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the call according to his purpose. Our lives, many times, the only answer we have to the to the terrible things that befall us is to just simply with blind faith look at God and say, God, I don't know why this happened. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know what I need to do. I don't, know, I don't know how I need to live right now. But all I can say is your Bible says, your word says that even though I don't understand it, it, it that if I belong to you, that you're going to work this thing out with other stuff and it's going to work together and it's going to be all right just because you say so. I don't have any evidence. I don't have any models. I don't have, I don't have any, any, nobody sent me a, 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 a telegram or a letter. Uh, it's it's going to be okay, God, you know. Uh, all I can do is just believe that you meant what you said, God. And hang on to Romans 8, 28 when bad things happen to good people. Well, if you're going to live a life that appropriates the grace of God, like Romans 8, 28 says we are, if you're going to hang on to Romans 8, 28, if you're going to believe Romans 8, 28, and if you're going to have any kind of answer to bad things happening to good people, especially when it's you, I mean, we, <laughs> we get real interested when the bad thing is happening to the good you. So there are about five questions you're going to have to answer when, when suffering comes into your life. I think if you can, if you can get these in your heart and if you, can, if you can get a grip on this and get an answer to this, how, what do I, what do I, how do I feel on this? What is my answer to this? I think these five questions, you'll make it, you'll make it delightfully through the good times and faithfully through the bad times in life. And here's the first question. First question is, is God good? Is God good? Brian, you just said it. We, we in Promise Keepers, all of us guys that went to Promise Keepers, uh, we had a phrase, a little mantra that we said all the time. And the leader would go, God is good. And then the congregation would go, all the time. And then the, then, then the moderator would go, all the time. And that... God is good. 
And that's our belief about the fact that God is good. When bad things happen to good people, when suffering comes into your life, you have to answer the question for yourself, is God good? Can I trust God to have my best interest at heart? Does God really care about me? Is God, it, 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 when everything seems to be going wrong, uh, can I trust my life to God? Well, to boil it down, here's what you have to ask yourself. Uh, it boils down to a character issue, doesn't it? It, it basically is, it basically is do, do, does God's character count for something when I don't understand what's happening in my life? Even though I believe God's good, man, terrible things are going on in my life. My dad just walked out the door. Somebody's getting a divorce. My kids are going wild and crazy. I made an F in the, in the class. I didn't, get my, I didn't get my check. I got fired. I don't have any money. The neighborhood is going crazy. My kids own drugs. Uh, lost a child. I mean, any, any and all of these scenarios and many more than that. Is God good? In spite of the fact that these terrible things happen and I don't understand why they happen, or how they happen, or why me, why do they happen to me, or my friend that goes to church every Sunday that reads his Bible faithfully, that ties a half of his income that everybody loves? Is that nailed down in me that I, that I can say God is good? He really does have my best interest at heart? Because look, if, if you can't trust the character of God, you can't get it nailed down that God is good. Because anybody I'm going to trust with my life, I'm going to have to know a little bit about their character. Now, I don't want to get melodramatic up here, but I mean, I do play a pretty important role in most of your lives. I'm your pastor. And what that means is, you trust me to tell you the truth and all the truth, even the hard truth, to do it in a loving way, but it's sometimes hard. Sometimes you just got to face the fact. We all do. That's why we need a Savior, you know. We're humans. Well, if you're going if, if to if you're gonna trust me to tell you the truth and to change your life based on what I say, it is only because you trust the character of the person who is speaking to you. And can we trust God's character? Well, Jesus many times in the New Testament, many times said basically, which of you convicts me of sin? Who has sin that I've committed that you can point out to me? The saints of the age, ages declare Jesus had no sin. The Bible says that he was without spot and without blemish. And Jesus stood before the Roman judicial system, which was the father of our judicial system, among, uh, stood three times before the roughest judicial system in the world and had Friends, people that were certainly not his friends, Pilate and Herod, and then back to Pilate again. And Pilate looked at him and said, why should I do this? This man has no wrong. Herod said, I can't find anything wrong with him. Pilate gets him back and says, I wash my hands of this blood of this innocent man. And I'm just saying to you that we can trust the, neck, the, the character of Christ because all of the witnesses that have ever testified says, God is good, and he's always good, and his character is flawless. So, sometimes a person can be good, and, and things can happen, and, and we, 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 we don't understand how sometimes things can get all messed up, but... But even when we determine God is good, sometimes his actions might not appear to be good. You know? And you know, that's when you get to shaking about him. When it just seems like whatever's happening doesn't seem like a good God could really do that. I mean, it would be like me with my children. 
If my children came to me one day and said, Dad, Dad, we love you. And we're, Dad, we're going to do everything you say just like you say it. We're not going to disobey anymore. And whatever you tell us to do, we're going to do it right there on the spot and never disobey you again. After they picked me up off the ground and woke me up a little bit, I would say, why do you say this? And the only way they could say that would be to look at me and say, Dad, I trust your character exclusively. And I know that you love me and you are good and you only have my best interest at heart. And they would have to believe that totally in order to make a statement to me like that. So what would I do as their dad if they came to me and said that? What would I do? Make life as miserable as possible for them? Drown their puppy dogs? Step on their turtle? Break their bicycle? Make them eat asparagus? No, what I would do I would do everything I could possibly do to make their life as great as possible and as easy and as simple as possible. And I think one of the reasons that we human beings have trouble trusting God exclusively and, 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 and obeying him exclusively and, and not have reservations about what happens in our life is because we have this tendency to think about God like we think about our parents. One of the reasons, listen, I've been, in, I've been in, in, in foreign lands on mission work, and I've been in lands. India is, is this perfect example. I went to India, stayed uh, 21 days or so, 20 days, I don't know, a long time. And we, and man, we witnessed, and you, know, you couldn't have a church service out on the street because they'd kill you, but you could go to somebody's house and do anything you wanted to with Christianity. And the Indian government loved Christianity because they found out when a, when a part of their country became Christian, it became prosperous. There you go. So the, Roman, so the Indian government said, hey, come on in, many as you want to. Come on, bring them in. We love it. So we would try to win people to Christ. And you know one of the biggest problems we had with those people? When we talked about God being our heavenly father, they had no relationship to that whatsoever. That did not even register with them. They did not have that kind of relationship with the Father. That was so foreign to them, they couldn't even grasp it. And I'm just saying that many times we human beings have problems with God and, and hearing God and knowing God and, and following God and loving God and trusting his character because we think of him like dad and dad's mean and dad does wrong things every now and then and dad's cranky and dad... <sighs> Look at your neighbor and say, get over it, man, would you? So, first question. I got to ask myself, when bad stuff happens to me is, is God good? The God that said, I'm working all things together for your good, is he good? If he's good, that means something. Second question, is God omnipotent? I didn't mean to throw this theology in on you. But that's, I mean, I could have said, is God all-powerful? Omnipotent means all-powerful. Omni, all, potent, powerful. All right, here's what I'm saying here. If God is not all-powerful, then what difference does it make if he's good? Because the goodness of God doesn't matter if God doesn't have the ability to perform that which is needed in all of our situations of life. Lawrence over here in a wheelchair. I know y'all know Lawrence is one of my best friends. I love him. I always have. Lawrence is a good man. I mean, he's a human being, but he's a good man. And he's compassionate and loving. And I would have no problem leaving any of my children or my grandchildren to Lawrence's charge. No problem whatsoever. But let's suppose... We, we, Lawrence was in a, in a home, and I brought in maybe a grandchild that was an infant, 
and this little, little fella couldn't even walk or anything, and I laid it on the bed. I put the little pacifier in there, and I looked at Lawrence, and I said, Lawrence, would you, would you watch him just a minute? And I, I need to walk out here to the mailbox. There was somebody I need to talk to, your neighbor over here, and I just saw him out, and I, I'll be right back. And, and, and when I left the house, let's suppose that house caught on fire, like something blew up in the middle of that house. Not a meth lab, I know y'all thinking that. But something blew up in the middle of and something blew up in the middle of the house. And fire was everywhere. Even though I trust him implicitly, I believe he is a good man and a kind man and a faithful man. And I believe he would do everything he possibly could to do everything to take care of that infant that's laying on that bed in there in that burning room. Uh, to the best of his ability, and even though I would believe that about him and that is true about him, he might not have the power to get in there to do it. I'm just saying that if God is good, I've got to believe that God is powerful enough to do something because goodness alone isn't good enough if you don't have the power to perform. I know most of us have never heard anything about Christian science. Have you ever heard of anything about Christian science? It's the religion, Christian science. I don't know why they call it Christian science because it's not Christian and it's not science. It's like, uh, you know, it's like grape nuts. Not grape and not nuts, it, you know. Well, one of, their, one of their major theologians is a guy by the name of Albert Feitzer. And here's what Albert Feitzer says. Albert says, Calvary was a terrible mistake. Listen to this. Listen. Calvary was a terrible mistake. God never intended it. Jesus was wonderful and God would have never let him die. He just loved him too much. But what happened was before God knew it, the situation got out of control. And before he knew it, Jesus was gone. This is, the theo this is their theology. And he reasons this. He reasons this. He writes this. This is, this is a conclusion of what, what he's thinking. He reasons if God was good, he would have never, I mean, he would have stopped the cross. If God was good, he would have stopped the cross. The fact that he didn't stop it shows if he is good, he is not all powerful. And if he is all powerful, he is not good. You know what Albert needs to understand? The difference between God's purposes and God's ways. Do you know God has purpose in life that are different many times from his ways? And in connection with Calvary, let me show you what I mean. Because you have to believe now, listen, if you're going to if you're going to live through this bad stuff happening to good people, you're going to have to know at once that God is both good and all-powerful. The cross is the perfect example of separating his ways from his purposes. His purpose for the cross was to save uh, the, this sorry, stinking, pitiful humanity on this earth. God's purpose for the cross was to sacrifice innocent blood for our guilty blood so we could be washed by the innocent blood and deserve heaven when we die to be in the presence of God. That was the purpose of God for Calvary. The way he did it was to take his only begotten son and put him on the earth and let him suffer and be beaten and be tortured and be tormented and his flesh be torn up so by his stripes we could be healed and let his blood pour out of his body. By the blood of Christ, we're washed from sin, be nailed to an old rugged cross so he could forgive the world. That's God's way. God's way was to put his son on the cross. His purpose was to save the world. So his way seemed barbaric. His way seemed terrible. His way seemed God. Jesus even said, can't you do it another way? But nevertheless, not what I will, what you will. You know. So... When bad stuff happens to you, one question, 
Is God good? Hey, this happened to me. God said all things happen for a purpose, and he'll take it and work it together with something else and work this thing so it'll be better. It'll be good. Do I believe that? Is God good? And, he, and, and does God have the, the, the power to perform anything he wants in life? Here's a third question you got to ask yourself. Is God reliable? Reliable. I mean, you know, it, will, he, will he do this every time? I put in your notes a little scientific thing. I know I didn't say it in a scientific way. But what it says is something is considered provable. In science, something is considered provable. If I can take a set of circumstances and make it happen one time, I prove that it could happen one time, that's provable. Something is said to be reliable when given the same set of circumstances, you can, you can have the same result every time. So I'm asking you, is God reliable? Given the set of circumstances, can we trust God to produce the same results every time? Well, it doesn't seem like it. Because, my goodness, it seems like there are times when God just lets me down. God doesn't come through. I've been praying for a miracle and no miracle happened. I've been praying for a healing. I've been praying for deliverance. I've been praying for money. I've been praying for my family. And God, it just doesn't happen every time. And I see other people. So do I think God is reliable? I mean, this is going to bring peace to me. This is going to bring comfort to me. Or it's going to torment me. The answer to that question. I've got to settle that. Let me approach you this way with it. You remember in the, in, in the first book of your Bible when God got sick of this old crazy world and there was nothing but evil in this earth and what did God say? He said, I'm going to destroy this place. And he spoke to the only righteous person that was on the earth, a fellow by the name of Noah. And he said, get out here and build me a big old boat because I'm destroying this place. And he got in, in Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives Eight people got on the ark, got animals on the ark, and then the bottom blew out, and the rain fell, and the waters came up from the earth, and the whole earth flooded, and, uh, and then the water, after some days, uh, the water began to recede, and God put a rainbow in the sky. You remember that? And what, what was that rainbow for? That, right, that was a promise from God that he would never destroy the earth by water ever again. And so many times, many times, when it rains, we get to see a rainbow. Many times. And when we see that rainbow, we enjoy it because it reminds us, if we're Christians, oh, that's a token from God that's a token God gave us that rainbow. And if somebody doesn't know it, you'll tell them. You say, you know why that rainbow? Because God made a promise with Noah that he was never going to destroy. That is a token of his promise right there. But we don't see it every time. And so does that mean that we can't always trust that God is going to keep that promise? Because, hey, we didn't see the rainbow. Hey, hey, that's what I mean. You'll get all shook up if you're depending on the token to prove that God is true to his word. If I'm all wrapped up in the token, when I don't see the token, I'm going to say, God, you're not reliable. God, you're... And sometimes God will give us a token. I mean, I've seen people healed. I've seen bodies that should have died, not die, and, and just be healed. I've seen, I've heard testimonies. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've heard people talk about their money being put back to, to, together, their child being raised from some sickness, getting a job, making a lot. I mean, I've seen all kinds of tokens of God's power on this earth. 
But because I don't see it every time, does that mean that God's not true to what his word is? No, because we have to trust the one who, who gave us the promise and said that was a token more than we trust the token. Is God reliable? Sure he is when you understand what reliable means. Here's the fourth question. Is God in a hurry? I'm in a hurry. Right? You're in a hurry. Is God in a hurry? Let me, let me read what I wrote in my notes to you because I'm going to get, get on to this one. I'll just read it. All right. Um, the story of Joseph. Give you just a little insight, and I wrote it. If you look on the back page of your notes, I, I gave you a little, little chronology, a little timeline kind of deal. All right, now just follow me. Joseph, ha uh, first thing that happened is Joseph has his dream, and he's sold into Egypt. Okay, that's the first thing that happened. That happens, by the way, that happened in 1729 B.C. Joseph is sold into slavery and sold into Egypt. All right, two years later, now just follow this. Two years later, he was thrown into prison for a crime he didn't commit. Twelve years later, he is finally released from prison. Seven years after that, the famine occurs. One year after that, his family arrives in Egypt to seek food during the famine. Five years later, his family settles as shepherds in Egypt. And 18 years later, Jacob dies and the boys come to Joseph and express their repentance in hopes of avoiding revenge that never comes. Joseph didn't, listen, Joseph didn't just decide when Jacob died that everything was all right. Everything had been all right. For all those 45 years I just enumerated, God had simply not chosen to reveal it until its appropriate time. How can I keep going when I'm in a hurry and God's not? I, I, I got to keep going back, not to providence, uh, not to my calendar, not to circumstance, but back to the character of the one who spoke the word and gave the promise. Because I'm always in a hurry and he's not in a hurry. So I've got to trust the character of the one who spoke the word and gave the promise. One more little deal here. One more question. Is God angry with me? This is a universal question, I think, that has been asked by every person who has ever suffered in life. Have any of you ever suffered anything in life and didn't ask God, God, why is this happening to me? Why, God, why? Mm hmm yeah. Why, God, why? What did I do to deserve this, God? Why is this happening to me? Are you mad at me? Did I do something wrong? Are you angry with me? Why are you doing this? Well, this is going to surprise you when I say this. But in, in, in my years of pastoring, all these, lo, these many years, <laughs> my years of pastoring and in my study of the Scripture. I have come to the conclusion that suffering is more often related to God's favor than it is to his disfavor. Let me say that again because I think I said it too choppy for you to get. Because I didn't see any of you pass out. So you obviously didn't hear what I said. What I said is, Suffering is more often related to God's favor rather than his disfavor. You say, you mean it happens because God loves me and not because God is mad at me? Well, look, you can do stuff that will get God's disfavor. I mean, God disciplines the prodigal. There are consequences for bad choices you make. Be not deceived, God's not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's still in the Bible. I'm not telling you that, that God's not going not to take you to the woodshed every now and then. But I'm just telling you that most of the time, it is not God's displeasure that brings suffering into your life, but indeed is God's 
pleasure that does this. And, and, and let me, I know, let me, this is, this, is why, this is why Jesus could say in the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, blessed, which is our word markyrios, which means happy. Happy are you when, when you're put down. Happy are you when you're reviled and persecuted and people say all manner of against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad about this, for great is your reward in heaven. What kind of nut are you, Jesus? What kind of masochist are you, wacko? You love pain? No, he says, he says, look, you just got to grasp this, thought, this fact that, that, that when I love you, I'm going to use you, and when I use you, you're going to suffer. I know a lot of times, I know a lot of times, Lord, you want to say, hey, God, don't love me so much, would you? <laughs> love Holly. <laughs> 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 but as long as we're in this world, listen, guys, as long as we're in this world, you know what we are? We are a spiritual thumbnail on the, word, on the world's uh, chalkboard. <laughs> And we are an antagonist to this world. You know why? Because we, this world is not our home. This world is not where we're stopping off. We are pilgrims in a foreign land, and we are headed in a whole other direction from them. We follow, we have a different source, we follow a different course, and, and we're led by a different force than the world has. And we're going to walk contrary to this world at all times. And so when I suffer as a Christian... Let me, give you, let, me, let me give you three ways we suffer in God's favor. I'm going to now quit, okay? You say, man, if I suffer in God's favor, what, how, what is it? All right, number one is identity. Because of our identity with Jesus Christ, we suffer. Jesus said, a servant is not better than his master. And if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation, but see that you be not dismayed, for I have overcome the world. And, and, and let me just ask you this, why was Joseph in prison? Joseph was in prison because he was sold as a slave. Why was he sold as a slave? He was sold as a slave because his brothers hated him. Well, why did his brother Hate him because he lived so close to the Lord that the Lord could speak to him and he could hear God speaking to him. And when he heard God speaking to him, he would tell him what God said. He didn't suffer because he was a sinner. He suffered because he was so close to God. And why was he in prison? Was it because he was involved in some immoral sex act? Is that what got him in prison? No, it was the fact that he wouldn't get involved in some immoral sex act with Potiphar's wife. I'm just telling you that Joseph suffered because of his right and righteousness, and he suffered exclusively because of his identity with God and doing what is right. And if you live a life that's close enough to God to hear the heart of God and the voice of God and the move of God, you're going to suffer. This world is not going to understand you. It's not going to want you. This world is not your home. My grandmother would call it being cured. <laughs> being cured. Yeah. yeah, Granny had a lot of wisdom, didn't she? Let me give you the second one. Here's the second insight about suffering, how you can handle suffering for, for good, for, for, for being right. All right, imagery. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and those that call according to his purpose. What does verse 29 say? Let me give you a hint. For whom he did foreknow. You got it? Them he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Wow, what does that mean? Well, all of us want to jump on Romans 8, 28 and say all things work together for good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose, which everybody look at yourself and say, that's me. Yeah, that's you. But the next verse says, 
And don't make any mistake about it. God is, going to, God is going to change you into an image that looks like Jesus. What does that mean? Let me ask you something. Do you look like Jesus right now? What do you look like? You look like a, a, a lump of granite or something, right? You got all these ends sticking out and points and corners and all that. I don't see a Jesus at all in that big lump of, cra big lump of rock right there. What does a sculptor do when he wants to sculpt her out? Some, like, like, like you've been to these places where giant horses and soldiers and beautiful people and all, and it's, and it's carved out of just rocks. A, a scu you know what a sculptor does? I can't draw a stick man, so I'm not talking about myself. But, but sculptors, what they'll tell you is, you say, how, how do you do that? How do, how do you carve this beautiful animal? out of this gigantic big block of something up here. He says, well, it's easy. Here's what I do. I look at that rock, and I see a horse. And everything that doesn't look like a horse, I chip it off. Listen, when you come to Christ, you are a lump of rock. You don't look anything like Jesus. You have prejudices. You have problems. You have sins. You have weaknesses. You have propensities. You, 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 you are a mess. So what God does is he takes the chisel of adversity and the hammer of trial, and he begins to chip, bing, chip, chip away everything that doesn't look like Jesus. And the more he chips, the more it hurts. But the more like Christ you become. I suffer because of my identity with Jesus. I, I suffer because of the fact that I'm being created into his image. And then let me just give this last one. I know we're finished, y'all. Wait a minute. What did, Tanya, what did you put up there? It ain't going back. I'll have to wait on my sound, man. But it doesn't matter. I can tell you what it is. Instrumentality. There it is. Instrumentality. That was Chris's way of saying, hurry up, let's go. Inst I probably did that myself. Instrumentality. All right, follow me now. And don't let this big word mess you up. All right, inst instrumentality. All right. It means, obviously, to be his instrument. So if I ask you, if I ask you, I said, do you want to be God's instrument? You might say, well, I think so. <laughs> or yes, I would. I'd like for God to use me. Now, don't be scared, okay? Just think about it. Do I want to be God's instrument? Do I want God to be able to use me? Well, he wants to use me. Because he says this, look out there in the fields. Do you see those fields are white with harvest out there? He says, the fields are white, but the laborers are few. The fields are always white. It's just that we don't have very many laborers in the field. God, when he saves my soul, calls me to become an instrument for him. And, and, and let me just sum it, sum it up this way in Joseph's story. The only reason that Joseph was, in, was put into that pit and, and sold to the Midianites and sold to the Egyptians and ended up in prison was because, was because God spoke to him and gave him the ability to receive and interpret dreams. The gift of God to interpret a dream. The ability of God to hear a dream and to receive a word from God and speak a word from God. And that gift was used while he was in prison. When a butler was thrown in and a baker was thrown in and, and that dream that, that ability manifested itself and Joseph told them what their dreams meant. And, 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 the, and the last verse of Genesis 40 says, 
Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so here's Joseph looking to get out of prison, and two years go by. And Pharaoh has a dream. And the, and, and the butler says, oh, man, I, I, there's this guy down there. What I'm saying is, suppose Joseph had gotten out of jail early. Let's suppose, what if when they let the butler out, they just said, hey, man, you've done enough time. Let's let you out. All right, come on. Have a good day, buddy. Where would Joseph have gone? Where would he have been? Could they ever have found him again? So because of the gift of God, the gift of God and him using the gift of God, now he ends up in tribulation and trouble and jail and suffering and blah, blah, blah. And, and then he uses it again and, he, and it still doesn't deliver him. And then two years later, here comes somebody down in the, in the jail waving the keys saying, man, I know right where Joseph is. Yeah, here he is, right, be right here. Come on out, Joseph, boy. We got a job for you. Come on up here. Man, I knew I could find him. I knew he wasn't going to be hard to find because I got him. And Joseph goes right up there and tells Pharaoh what God says. And God says there's going to be a famine and you need to get ready or everybody in the world is going to die. Including Israel. And I'm just going to remind you that God birthed Christ through the Jews. No Jews, no Messiah. No Jews, no lineage of Christ. God used Joseph to save the Jews so there could be a Messiah so me and you could be sitting right in these nice padded chairs right here today with a heart that loves God and a spirit that's going to heaven when we die. We owe that to the suffering of Joseph. Because Joseph suffered, we get to enjoy the privileges of that suffering. And notice this, that the thing that put him in prison was the very thing God used to get him out of prison. <laughs> God's pretty smart, isn't he? <laughs> He's pretty smart. He's